Hi, in this video I'll, I want to walk you through two basic types of science writing and show you some examples. Um, I'm going to point out a few things in terms of some of the principles, the writing principles that we're covering in this course. Just a little bit of a preview, but I wanted to show you some examples of what I and others have considered effective science writing. So let's look at some examples. So basically, as I said, there is two major types I would describe science writing. Oh, I would categorize science type uh, science writing. Um, number one is writing published in academic journals for mainly academic audiences, and in there, including grants um, such as NIH grants um, or for the National Science Foundation, NIH being the National Institutes of Health. So those are texts that are written for a predominantly academic audience. So we'll, we'll see in those kinds of texts a good amount of jargon, meaning very specific language. Later on, you'll have a whole section on how to avoid jargon and how to think about jargon, depending on your audience and your genre and your context. But in general, this type of science writing for academic audiences, mostly in journals, in reports, grants, and so on, um, you will find very specific language in there. The second, uh, second part of science writing, um, second category I consider is writing published for a more general audience. And this includes science journalism, such as the New York Times, Washington Post, and so on, blogs, books, and so on. So I'm going to show you a few examples for each of those two categories, um, just to set the tone. Um, and neither one of those is better or worse than the other. Um, however, I think our goal as writers, no matter in which genre we write, should always be to follow effective science writing principles like the ones we're covering in this class as much as possible, meaning that, you know, reduce our language from, you know, long sentences, making sure we have a red thread, we have well-structured paragraphs, we use more active than passive voice, um, you know, we avoid nominalizations, use strong verbs, etc., etc. These are, of course, uh, all referring to some of the principles that you folks will be working with over the next eight weeks. So let's look at some examples. So first category, academic audiences. And I've chosen an introduction from a former colleague of mine um, in Germany. Um, uh, he's a geologist. So this is from sort of a geology, uh, ecology kind of perspective. The journal it was published is Global Ecology and Biogeography. Um, all of the... Wherever I've taken these uh, excerpts from that I'm showing in this video, all of that material is in your supplemental material section on your Blackboard module site. So you can, if you're interested, you can read the whole articles or you can see where I've taken some of the um, samples from. So in this case, I've, I've copied the link, I put the link on there to the entire article. It's an open access journal. So this is a really well written first paragraph introduction. Now it is for an academic audience. But it still has a lot of active language in there um, and a lot of di you know, directness. So what you notice, of course, is lots of citations, right? You don't see that usually in the other category, of, you know, science journalism and books and so on, where people have or writers have a lot more freedom. But in our academic conventions, we have to be very careful about referencing and citing. So let's just go through this together. Landscape modification, habitat fragmentation have become major research themes in conservation biology. Very clear sentence sets the tone for the whole article. And the article is a synthesis of articles on landscape modification, habitat fragmentation. So yay, this sentence tells me clearly that's what this article will be about. They are considered severe threats to global biodiversity and are believed to negatively affect virtually all taxonomic groups, including birds and mammals. Again, pretty straightforward. The only maybe specific language here is taxonomic groups. But again, in this context, writing for an academic audience, as a writer, you can expect that your audience will probably understand what that means. Um, and then it lists, you know, the different groups, reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates, and plants, and so on. Again, some more specific jargony type of language there uh, that probably the general public might not necessarily know of or would have to look up or would need some explanation for, but doesn't have to be provided here again because the audience is an academic audience. The article, uh, the, the introduction paragraph continues, although fragmentation has become a major research theme, progress in the field has been hampered by overly, overly restrictive conceptual paradigms 
and the imprecise or inconsistent use of important terminology. So in this first paragraph, what the writers are doing, they're walking us through the major context of their paper, which is about landscape modification, habit fragmentation, giving some specific examples how these two things are severe threats, and then some of the complications and some of the research that has been done on these um, uh, in these fields. So clearly written, um, we wouldn't find a, a paragraph like this probably in a in a journal like the New York Times in a more you know uh, publication that's read by a larger audience. But that's okay. So this is still clear and effective writing, um, predominantly because of active language. The sentences aren't too long if you take out the citations, of course, that is. Um, but if you take out the citations, each sentence is pretty digestible. Um, and it flows really well and is structured well with a clear topic sentence at the beginning, landscape modification, right? And habit fragmentation has become major research themes. That's a very good topic sentence. You'll learn more about those in the um, next, I think, in the next module two. Um, some more examples. And then sort of the issue, right? Namely, that there are some issues in the current research on these kinds of topics. So, overall, pretty well done. So, let's look at this other category when writers are writing for a more general audience. So, here I have um, copied a paragraph from a very famous book. Uh, by Lewis Thomas, Lives of a Cell. It's a collection of short essays from cell biology that even somebody like me, I don't have a great background in cell biology, even I can understand. So Lewis Thomas writes, the microorganisms that seem to have it in for us in the worst way, the ones that really appear to wish us ill, turn out on close examination to be rather more like bystanders, strays, strangers in from the cold. They will invade and replicate if given the chance, and some of them will get into our deepest tissues and set forth in the blood, but it is our response to their presence that makes the disease. Our arsenals for fighting off bacteria are so powerful and involve so many different defense mechanisms that we are in more danger from them than from the invaders. We live in the midst of explosive devices we are mined. So very vivid language describing very complex biological processes uh, and some of the mechanisms that this writer, Lewis Thomas, is using, using a lot of we and you, right? And if you've um, uh, if noticed, um, or you, we and ours and so on, um, our arsenal, so a lot of personal pronouns to draw the reader in. You might have noticed in some of the writing assignments, um, I asked you specifically not to use personal pronouns, because I want you to practice writing from a more sort of academic style. But there are some um, assignments where you also write for a more general audience. So this is a good example um, where a science writer is using actually an analogy very successfully to explain to a lay audience how um, disease mechanisms works on a, work on a cell level. So again, Lewis Thomas is, at the time, was a very accomplished scientist. I don't think he would have included a passage like this in any of his scientific writing. But this is science writing at its best for a general audience, which is very clear, you can follow it, it's very vivid, and it draws the reader in. But it follows some of the similar principles, very active language, and then the previous introductory paragraph from the academic um, side. So it has short sentences, very active language, or shorter sentences, I should say, active language, um, and well-structured and follows, it has a great, it has a story to tell. Let me show you another example. This is an article from the New York Times, um, just from uh, this August. Um, elephants ought to get a lot of cancer. They're huge animals weighing as much as eight tons. It takes a lot of cells to make up that much elephant. All of those cells arose from a single fertilized egg, and each time a cell divides, there's a chance that it will gain a mutation, one that may lead to cancer. Strangely, however, elephants aren't more prone to cancer than smaller animals. Some research even suggests they get less cancer than humans do. On Tuesday, a team of researchers reported what may be a partial solution to that mystery. Elephants protect themselves with a unique gene that aggressively kills off cells whose DNA has been damaged. Now, obviously, this is written for a general audience, readers of the New York Times, who are intelligent, educated adults, most of the time, I would assume. Um, right? It's not, um, it's a sophisticated publication, but it is still one for a general audience. It's a news reporting um, uh, newspaper. So um, so this is a good example of how a science writer, a science journalist, translates from really complex 
research findings into plain language. But again, he does it so just similar to the previous two sections we've seen, um, passages we've seen, drawing the reader in with sort of a general statement. Um, of course, it's done in a slightly different way than the introduction for the research article did that I showed you earlier. Um, and the piece by Thomas was also, you know, it was another introductory piece. But again, the focus here is on story, right? Drawing the reader in. Active language. You also see a lot of um, uh, contractions, which I am not a big fan of for more formal academic writing. You want to be careful with that. Um, you could use them in responses to uh, forum entries, uh, to other people's entries, unless they're more formalized. But in general, I would avoid contractions in more formal academic and scientific writing. However, in a newspaper context, you have very, very different stylistic type of uh, regulations and rules that writers will follow. But again, the, the idea is the same. You keep your sentences clear and active, and you tell a story and you structure your paragraphs. In this case, they're fairly short. You structure them in a way that your reader can tell a story. Now, to finish up, I want to show you actually the piece from the uh, from the researchers that this is based on, that this article that um, Zimmer wrote is based on, which you will and you will see the difference. And it talks about the same findings about the zombie gene that elephants seem to have that prevents them from getting cancer, at, you know, prevents them from getting cancer, or at least at lower rates than other mammals. So here it is. Large-bodied organisms have more cells that can potentially turn cancerous than small-bodied organisms, imposing an increased risk of developing cancer. This expectation predicts a positive correlation between body size and cancer risk. However, there is no correlation between body size and cancer risk across species, and so on. And then later on, they introduce this sort of zombie gene. So if you look at this small um, paragraph from the summary, and the article is in general very short, so if you want to take a look at it, it's again in your supplemental materials. You see the difference in the language. The sentences are a little bit longer. Some of the language is more complex, although it is still fairly straightforward and understandable. Even I can follow what these researchers are talking about. Now, when we go down the line a little bit more here, it talks about the leukemia inhibitory factor pseudogene LIF6 with pro-apoptotic pro -apoptotic functions. That's when you lose me as a general, when the readers lose me as a general audience. But again, that's okay. The focus of this article is to share research with other researchers who are probably familiar with some of these more discipline-specific or jargon-like terms. Um, so again, if you compare this passage to this passage talking about the same things, you will see the difference between those two types of um, science writing that I, the two categories I like, or the, the two categories that I like to use to classify science writing very clearly. General audience here in the New York Times, here much more specific in the cell reports. Okay, so have fun with some of the readings this week and the activities, and I'm looking forward to reading your assignments and your discussion posts this week.